you ever <laughs> changed the way you write to appease authors or I'm sorry, to appease readers and what you Hell no. no. Hell no. Hell no. No, 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 no. I write for me. All of my books that I've written and I've published are for moi. If someone buys it and reads it, brilliant. But I published them, I wrote them all for moi. Yeah. You know, and I think that's that right there is at the core of what it is to be a writer. There's no, I don't know how you guys feel, but I am not a pretentious, I am on this pinnacle, I am a god of words, I am, no, it's a, I like story, and I don't like the stories that are out there, because I like my stories to go a different way, so I write where I want them to go, and sometimes they're stupid, and sometimes they're awesome, and sometimes they're really disappointing and gory, and sometimes they're abrupt, and I love it that way. And then I get somebody, a reader who will write to me or, or review it, and they will come back saying, well, I felt this was the case, or this was the case. Yes, it is flowery and overwordy, because I like it that way. <laughs> and it's, it's that simple. It, it's, I absolutely love every single word in could my you, book. Could you imagine if you actually listened to readers about what they want? Can you imagine what our books would be like? Yeah, really. Oh, I don't, I don't like flowery no, writing. No, I don't no. like those over detailed called, work. Those I don't are like cliffhangers. <laughs> those are called writers. <laughs> I, I, there is an assumption at some point between the reader and writer relationship where there was a mistake. There was something lost in translation where a reader walked away and went, well, you're writing this for me. You're supposed to be appeasing me. And, and I, as a reader, do the same thing. I'll pick up Patrick Rothfuss, and I expect something from him. And when he doesn't deliver, I take it like a, well, what are you doing? Why aren't you appeasing me? Isn't that interesting? But like he ever writes for me, like he even knows me. Like he doesn't write his own books for him. But yeah. there is an expectation, like, you disappoint me, Mr. Rothfuss. It's like when I think, yeah, if it's, <laughs> yeah. if it's in a series, if it's in a series and those readers have read the first two books mm -hmm. and your third one's just come out, yes, they expect it to smash the first two and they yeah. do have a high expectations for this book. And if you don't deliver, then you'll come your one, two, three star reviews. But what do you mean? See, see, there it is again. If they don't deliver. What delivery? Whoever said I was writing for readers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just said I don't write for readers. I don't. Here you are going, you haven't delivered, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, like, and... and when I wrote my memoir, and I think memoir is very particular with this kind of genre, no memoir is ever written for a reader. And that is made very, very clear. All memoir, I'm generalizing, and I, I am curious if I am wrong on this, but I, I do believe that all memoir is written for the author. Of and course it is. Yeah. yeah very I think much. That, that genre specifically yes. kind of... It, kind of is written for the author and but the readers the are readers. just kind of voyeurs yes, in that. Yes, exactly. But the readers of memoir go in reading this knowing this is not for me. And they, this is going to sound really bad. They, they keep their place. They know their place and they keep it. <laughs> they don't step over that boundary. But when you get into fantasy, when you get into any other genre, Children's books don't do this either. Children read the book and, ooh, there is no expectation. There is something that happens with every other genre where the reader suddenly gets this, you must write for my like. And if you don't, I'm going to write a nasty review. And it's, I probably just lost all my readers because I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I love you all. But that's, that's interesting because I, as a reader, do this too. I will sit down and I will, I, re I read Rowling's book five and I get angry with her and how dare you write this slap with Dolores Umbridge. And it, it's, it's interesting where we stand with the reader writer relationship. Yeah. Well, well, readers get invested, especially with, yeah. with fantasy, mystery and romance with the series, mm -hmm. especially they get invested in the characters and it's like, yeah. 
yeah, these people are my friends. You can't do that yes! to my friends. Oh, there you go. That's exactly it. That's my friend you're talking about. That is exactly yes. Oh, no. Exactly. Especially if you kill one of them off, it's like, oh, no, you <laughs> killed off my friends. Oh, yeah. they would not like my books then. <laughs> they wouldn't like mine either. They're after meant more to me than my children. What yeah. do you yeah. <laughs> I mean, I used to have a running body count as I wrote my books on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, okay, I finished my book today, you know, six people were killed in it. That's nice. That's nice. That's <laughs> oh, the, 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 poor, the poor readers of Ruined City, though, I mean, I massacred a whole palace in that book. Yeah. And I remember even... Because it, it was all off page, though, so I it wasn't had, gruesome. I had beta readers, and I had this one particular event in one of my books, and my beta reader came back and said, if you keep this in the book, I'm not going to buy it. I will not read book two. Well, you don't have to. What, what, what do you, it stays in the book. It has to happen. No, no, no. I am not. If you do this, if you kill off this person, I, I will not. Like, he was threatening me. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm not going to alter a massive section of the story to make sure I keep book sales. Even if it is yours. <laughs> I, I, no, sorry. Character has to die. when what makes you decide to kill a character what is your to move the story along do you ever purposely slaughter somebody just to do that <laughs> um like is that yeah. a tactic or yeah i mean uh, going i'm giving the whole um the whole cliff cliffhanger away now for the uh, lawless justice about the kittens the uh, female motorcycle club um the leader of the kittens, she gets killed right at the end. Mm -hmm. And everybody, the readers, are invested with these ladies. They've been through their lives. They've been through all their experiences. And to, they know who Raven is. They love Raven. They hate Raven, whatever. They're invested in her. So for me to kill her off was like, uh, but she had to die for the ending of the story to happen. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not going to give away the ending because that's totally a different ball game. But uh, she had to die; otherwise, the ending couldn't have been, couldn't have played out the way it did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I kill off a lot of people. I mean, it's kind of the nature of horror writing. Mm -hmm. Dark yeah, fantasy. Is. <laughs> people die a lot, yeah, it's funny. and gruesomely. <laughs> yeah, I guess, and gruesomely. Yeah, and the more gruesome, the better. The, the the genre does determine who dies how often yeah. and so, but i mean i mean i just but i don't kill off people just to you know throw in For an the extra body it, yeah yeah but i mean there's actually a purpose when people die i mean exactly there you go so i have to ask what is your purpose when you kill someone anita <laughs> <laughs> well general with, with, with my villain series i mean the purpose is you know they're villains that's what villains do. They kill people, generally gruesomely. Yeah. But do the villains die? Well, not in the villain series, because in my villain series, the villains are actually the, the protagonists. They're the heroes of the piece. So they, oh, they survive, no. and all the innocent people die. I want to hold on a minute. What book is this? Which one? This is, is the Killer and Demon series. I've got two of them out, and there's a third one on its way probably that next year. That is really a clever, that's really an interesting take on that. Yeah. I mean, people seem to like it. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the few people that have read them. Yeah. Um, but so, I mean, and, but I mean, they're not from the faint of heart because I mean, they're, they're, they're villains. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And some yeah. of them are quite nasty. And, but, but my favorite character is in that series is Balthazar. He's a demon and he's a bounty hunter for hell. Mm -hmm. Ooh, cool. So he, he chases escaped souls and he's pretty much the most ruthless thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, just, exactly. he lives to kill people. <laughs> Let's put it that way. He does. He lives to kill people. And well, he yeah, he's, well. a, he's a bounty hunter from hell. That's his job. Yeah. Well, he's a demon too, which kind of helps. See, and it's interesting. I, I wrote my uh, Will the Zombies from Space, and I actually have a really... I, I started it and it was awesome. And then I got to a point where my, my psychology changed and I suddenly had a really hard time with violence. I suddenly had a really hard time with gore and I'm writing a zombie book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
as an author, I got to that particular point of the story where every time the zombies had to do something gruesome, I, I really worked around the disgust and the, and the gore of it, which, which is just really, I'm, I'm interested to see the other writing challenges I'm going to come that I'm going to run into in the future. But while we're ruining the end of a book, I'll go ahead and tell you mine. Um, <laughs> at the end of zombies, it, it's, it's a very abrupt ending. I mean, it is, it, it, I got to the ending and I was like, okay, I'm done. The story's over. I want to get to book two. And it reads like that. And I know I'm going to have so many reviews coming back going, well, that was an abrupt ending. That was, I'm going to have a lot of very angry, um, angry readers about it because it does feel rushed. It does feel like it's suddenly, okay, done next thing. And the next thing is the next book. And I don't care. <laughs> I really, I, it's, this is where, when it comes to catering to the reader, um, as the writer, I got to that part and I'm just like, I don't, I'm, I'm done with this. The story's over. I'm not going to do that lavish, let's, let's tie up all the nice ends. Let's go ahead and close it beautifully so we can get on to, no, it was, it literally reads like I just ended a chapter and you go to turn the next page for the next chapter and there, it isn't there. Is it, is it a cliffhanger or have you just left it open to do another book? Well, oh. there, see, I guess it would be, what is the difference? What is the difference between a cliffhanger and... is when the reader starts giving you death threats because <laughs> <laughs> you should never leave that book on a cliff. I'm going to wait a whole year before I can read and well, see what happened to it. Right there, right there. It's not a whole year. This is my blog novel, so I'll actually be releasing it here in a couple of days. So they'll read it. And I mean, it will be published on my website literally the day the next book is uh, April 7th is when the book releases. It's on pre-order now. So on April 7th, they can go to my website and read the next chapter. And then a month after that, there'll be a new chapter. So I don't feel bad. So when you say, uh, talking about the cliffhanger and the open, with um, Illusional Reality, even though I'd written a book too, as far as I was concerned, I left book one open. So it could go on to book two, but it would um, lay down and die on its own without a uh, sequel. Okay. But all of the readers assumed there was going to be a book two. Okay. They seem to think it ended on a cliffhanger where I don't. So that's quite a... That's interesting. That whole, is it, is it over or is there more to the story? Um, in that case, yeah, I would, I would call it a cliffhanger. Um, that chapter is over. That section of the story is definitely over. There was one single goal and that was destroy the vampires and they do, and they get out of there. Um, one of the characters is not in the best of shape. You know, she's either not going to make it or she's, she's the main character. So she, of course she's going to make it, but how like she's, she's unconscious. They carry her away from the ruins and the book ends. And oh, right, yeah, so the, the reader doesn't know if she makes it or not, yeah, which yeah. is how, that's very similar to how I ended with Illusional Reality, yeah. was it a, did he or did he not? Yeah, yeah. Well, th that's kind of a cliffhanger, but it's also kind of an open ending. Yeah. There is a difference between a cliffhanger and an open ending. A cliffhanger you kind of leaves them in mortal danger. Yeah, okay, Usually. The is, yeah, the danger is definitely... And an open ending is like, okay, it's over, but... Yeah. Don't, what don't, happens don't. next? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that, that, I do feel a lot better about that abrupt ending then. Now, here's the other thing that I saw, and this, this is something that just grates on me, and I'm going to pull from the Pirates of the Caribbean movie because I think they, they do this very well. When they made the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, it was, the story was done. There was no plan to come back. There was no sequel. It was done. The reader, I'm sorry, viewer upcry was such that they went, oh, oh, all right, I guess we're going to do another. And they did the second <laughs> and third one back to back. They planned it. They, they went, all right, I guess we're turning this into a trilogy. Yeah, and, and totally funny. ruined the first movie. Is that, I, I love the movies. But, I love them too, but the, the first and the second and third one sort of undid everything in the first. Yeah, no, it did undo everything in the first. And this is, this is the interesting thing. First of all, they threw all the scenery away. They threw everything away. The sash that Jack was wearing is of a very particular fabric. 
that doesn't exist anymore. So in the second movie, they had to recreate the costume, but they couldn't, the fabric was discontinued. So what they found was actually not what they needed. And that's when they, they okay, well, that thing that his decorative hair piece that they have, yeah, let's, let's work that into the script. And they scrambled putting together parts two and three. So the question is, is that an open ending? But with the second movie, from first to second movie, I'm trying to, yes, from the first movie to the second movie, when you start up the story, it's months later. It, it's, it's really a long time later, which is where I have a problem with stories. Um, with, my, with my zombie book, when book two starts up again, it's only going to be a few hours later. So there's no gap. And really, when I read a book, that's what bothers me as a reader is how much of a gap between point A and point B. Are we looking at a few months, a few weeks, years? And I expect it to be like in Harry Potter, you have a three month gap, and sometimes even a, a month where you've got that summer vacation inserted between each book. So I'm wondering, in contrast, you've got that cliffhanger open ending but on the other side of that is the when you um when the book continues when the story continues are you jumping ahead two years are you jumping ahead a month is it a few hours later does yeah. does something like that one particular do or do not bother you as a reader it would depend i think on the book and how it's done because i mean if you had a cliffhanger where somebody was like mortally wounded or something and then the next book opened like a year later and everybody's fine yeah, yeah I'm that not would okay bug with me that. that that i'm not okay with <laughs> that would bug me yeah because i mean if you've got somebody mortally wounded you want to know exactly what happened yeah. how he got better or died or whatever yeah, you want to be with them at their bedside i think yes. that's it right there you expect to be with them through the healing process and you take an emotional blow as a reader when something happens to the characters you love yeah. you are invested as karina said and you you want to see that they're okay you're there and then when it jumps to a year and everyone's fine you're not mm -hmm. you are not okay because in your brain they're still dying and wounded, and, and you got gypped. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I notice that a lot in TV shows. <laughs> you do that, don't you, Karina? I, 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 I didn't. Now that you've just said that, I understand what I've just done. But when, when, when he's left on the, when he's left at the end of um, Illusion of Reality, did he or didn't he? They don't find out until the middle of book two. Oh. So, but no, but they don't need to find out oh, in the middle cares? till the middle That's of book two. Fine. They don't need because oh. there's too much going on. I there's too much going on. I, I have to pull from this because this is a great um I don't mind um cliffhangers and I will tell you why. When I was thirteen years old I read Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. <laughs> that book he would introduce you to Jean Valjean, and you get a good solid 150 pages of Jean Valjean's life. And then it would break off at a cliffhanger, and it would jump you to Fontaine's life. And you'd get 150 pages solid of Fontaine's life. And then it would break, and it'd jump you to Cosette. And it had eight stories. You were, you were tossing around Cosette, Fontaine, Jean Valjean, Javert, um, the Tenarias, Eponine, and marius mm. and it was a constant rotation through the whole book and the war and then it was the actual historical french revolution so there were these eight stories it was always in order so jean valjean was always the eighth the first of the eight rounds by the time you got to his story you a had moved on forgotten and didn't care and he does it through the whole book. It's 1,400 pages. And he spends all 1,400 pages on this cycle, on this eight-story cycle. Ooh, this, crazy. This is why I love watching the musicals and the film, because <laughs> then you don't have to read oh, the boring book. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. By the time, no, the boring part was the, the war. I, I could have done without the war part. I, I was like, really? I don't care about Napoleon. But the rest of it, I was like biting my nails. And I'll tell you, by the time I was done with Les Mis, I was going, okay, all right. No, no cliffhanger can ever bother me again. And it hasn't bothered me. So long as you don't jump two years. Yeah. You don't jump I mean, two years. That is the one problem with the cliffhanger, especially when they have cliffhangers in the chapters. Yeah. And then, like, if you're reading the chapter and it goes, <gasps> and then the next chapter is somebody else. 
or another part of the story is like, okay, yeah, this is interesting. Get back to the guy all falling off the cliff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all Victor Hugo does in Les Mis. That is, that is 100% what it's like reading Les Mis. And it's, it's really emotional, like, <laughs> it's really, it keeps you reeling. 